Okay, so you guys are able to see my screen as well, right? <laughs> okay, so yesterday we have run on Windows uh, Scala, okay, and IntelliJ in Windows, okay. So I'll show you once, like uh, if you are set up Ubuntu, right, in VirtualBox, so how can you install the Scala? It's very pretty simple, same thing. Uh, you have set environment variable in Windows, and here in the Ubuntu, we have to set in the bash RC, right? We have to set the Scala home path we can set in bash RC. Okay. So you need to set up first. Uh... <clears throat> so here, uh, once you have Scala downloaded, so you have to download the Scala. So you have to download from the website. Okay. So if you see my screen here, so in my software folder, So I have downloaded the Scala tar file and then unzip it. Okay, so this is Scala 2.12. Okay, and I go inside this, I have a bin, doc, lib. Okay, so these are the folders are there. Okay, so I need to just simply go to nano bashrc. This is the bash profile file. Go inside this file, go inside this file and uh, set the uh, Scala home and Scala bin path. So you set the Scala home and Scala bin path. Yeah, Scala home and Scala bin path. So you should get the same exactly the path where the Scala is. Um, Scala is there. So once you come out from this, how to save it? Control X, Shift Y, Enter. Because I have already saved it. So I'm just directly coming out. And after this command, you have to do source PASHRC. So when you do BASHRC, when you do source BASHRC, it will save your, whatever you have set the path, it will save. And then you simply, you simply start the Scala. So it will be start the Scala shell. It will start the Scala shell. And you can do, the same thing like whatever we have done practical yesterday. So you can define function, you can create object, classes, case class, pattern matching, harder function, recursion, anything you can do. So you can write a function. Arvinda, this currying function and write, what is the difference between those? Which one? Which one? Uh, currying function and trait. Currying and trait, actually both are different things. Currying is the, um, okay, first understand the trait. Trait is like a class type of uh, component, right? Like similar to class, right? Okay, so we say like we have a trait, we have a class, we have a case class, we have a companion class, right? So trait is a, like a, a interface where we providing the abstract and non-abstract method, okay? And when I'm extending trait, and uh, then I can override those one. Or if I have already implemented, I can use it. So then what is the difference with abstract class? Because abstract class also doing the same thing, right? But abstract class, you cannot extend to abstract class, right? So that's a limitation with the class, right? But trait is not a class, not exactly class. It's an in interface type of component, which is providing abstract method, non-abstract method. So you can extend one trait and then another trait you can do with, okay, with cloud. Yesterday I showed, right, uh, like you have created trait, some trait you created my trait, and then you say, I have uh, some method here, uh, tap display, okay, and in this method, some body is there. And now you have a one class, class, my class, and then you extend my trait, okay? Now you can use this one, right? So you can you can use this trait uh, functions. So this is basically you can if you want to override it again, you can override it. Right? Same like the abstract class, we can override the function. Okay. But here, suppose you have two traits. Okay. So you can use trait one, trait two. So you can extend one trait and another trait you can. You can use another one trait is extend and another trait you can use with my trait. But in your uh, uh, like a file, trait and abstract class both are there. If abstract class is there and trait is there, in that case you have to extend first 
abstract class and then trade. Okay, so this is the hierarchy. And what is currying? Currying is uh, a kind of function category. Okay, so suppose I'm defining one function sum. Okay, and I say this sum function is taking two parameters. Okay, input parameter one is a uh, uh, id id colon int and okay x comma int x and the second value is a y and it should be in a separate round bracket will be there it will not be in a single bracket okay generally function we write with the single bracket but here we have to write in curry individual bracket okay so at a time you can pass one parameter it should be accept acceptable okay in the my object when i want to use this function in my object i want to use this function so how can i use it first i will create a some variable i want to get a result of this currying function so this function is called currying function is called currying okay it's a kind of category of function currying so i will be doing some i will be calling this function with the one parameter and put underscore okay and this result this result has your this two value is two because when i do x plus y here when i do x plus y i want to return here right the value x and value y but right now value y is not there okay so still it is holding your value x that value two okay next time when you say result one then you say result of three so what this result of three so this result three you are passing the second parameter so finally output will be when you print result one you will get the output five okay so currying is basically you can give the lesser number parameter fewer number of parameters as required okay and get your result so sometimes you can understand okay you can understand like where it is the uh, useful right suppose i'm doing some long running function okay some function is there okay my function and this function you got some value here x x value you can you got it here okay and some statement you are doing statement one statement one statement two okay so many statements are there okay after that you got y value here okay you got y value here so here you can do your final sum you can do so here what you will do first you will call this part okay okay even you can do the actual sum here itself right for the both the values but you can keep it hold so that your value should not be changed suppose this value you want to change in other statement and your value can be changed also or you can override the value rather than that override value you you can copy this value you, you can use this value here in your currying function first pass this and finally you pass this second value and then get the final result once you get this value you can get the this so so here the this is the main importance of the curry. okay okay it's clear trade and the curry no yes sir it's kind of waiting for other uh, input parameter yeah so definition says like uh, if you have the fewer number of parameters you can pass it like you have a suppose some function with three parameters so two you know right for some at least two parameter is needed right okay so even you have two parameter you will keep it some but when the third parameter is coming then you are adding it when fourth is coming then you are adding it okay but you have to decide how many number of total parameters you want to keep it you have to decide in the beginning right so it it can take that number of maximum number of parameters okay okay so today i'm going to start the the concepts which are left okay i have prepared one scala interview question doc okay i have already posted so you guys can see how many question answer you can give okay so these are questions same from the t point scala only so you can uh, analysis right your uh, knowledge right like how many questions you can answer high order function uh, function composition so right? these are the straightforward definition kind of questions okay anybody is asking questions so you can answer those questions okay yeah so some programmatic questions can come somebody can ask you to write code as well but uh, but but first you should know the the proper definition of the each and every concept like inheritance and this 
uh, polymorphism, final, all these are the uh, conceptual things, okay, throw, throws. So th these things I will go through today, okay, like a string, exception handling, collection. So these things I will be going to cover today, okay. Okay, so I'm going to start the Scala. So you understood, right, uh, how to use uh, Scala in uh, in uh, Windows and how to use Scala, but mostly Windows just we are doing for practice purpose. But when we are doing uh, uh, like a Spark, Kafka, all these uh, uh, Hadoop ecosystem component, everything is on the Ubuntu only. So ultimately you have to do the Scala practice on the Ubuntu. But for timing, if you are not able to set up Ubuntu, you can do in uh, Windows, but uh, the ultimate goal is uh, to install, configure your uh, IntelliJ idea, your your uh, Scala, Spark, everything should be there. And Spark is also easy. So Spark, uh, just you go to the Spark website, you go to the download Spark. The similar way, like you have set the path. So you download the Spark, you go to the download Spark here and select the version 3.3.2 .3 or 3, any version. And then you select here any Scala version, which is Scala version, and download this star file. Keep it this star file somewhere, and then set the bash RC path, and then you can you can start this uh, Spark. So if I show you, if I type uh, Spark hyphen shell, so it will be giving me also the Scala shell. I yesterday I told about that. So either you are doing Scala, only Scala you type or Spark hyphen shell you type, both are giving Scala because this is a Spark Scala API. But here you can write a Spark code as well as Scala code. Backward compatibility is there, right? You can write Spark because it is a Spark only. So a Spark will work and you can write a Scala well and where those code you can also write. Okay. So when you write well x equal to 10 and you can write. So Scala will work. So when you install Spark, you can work with Spark and Scala both or separately Scala also you can use. Okay, separately Scala also you can use. Okay, but both are giving you the same command line prompt Scala. When you type, when you type pi Spark, then you will get the triple greater than sign and you will get the pi Spark shell. Okay, so triple greater than sign, this is a pi Spark. So if you, here you can write the Python code. So these two are the interactive shell. Here you can write code and you can read the file, you can connect to the MySQL, Hive, or you can connect any NoSQL database. Everything you can test on this Spark shell, you can do. Or you want to do programmatically, so you have to create a Maven project. There you have to jar, connector jar you have to use, and then you can integrate with Spark with any component, right? Whether it's a uh, SQL, NoSQL, Elasticsearch, Kafka, anything you can connect with the Spark. Okay. So you can do practice for both Spark and Scala. So Scala, we are learning the APIs, libraries, and that libraries we can use in the Spark. Okay. Using the Spark API, we can use in the Scala. Okay. So what is a string? So we know, right, uh, a string is uh, like when we are defining a string variable in the double quote. So that is kind of a string data type. That is a string data type. And this data type is, if you check the type, it will be a string type. When you check the type, okay, so when I this one and say type S1. So type is coming, type is coming, a string type. It's a string type, okay. So when, when we are saying the, what is the type of the double code value, so it's a string type. So when I when I define any string, right? So I can I can simply print the string or I can set the string. But a string is a immutable. We already know in Java, Java string is a immutable. So when you do some operation on a string, you can assign a new string. You can create a new string. So if you see this example, so here I'm having a one string S1. I'm I'm trying to modify here a string. So I'm just adding uh, this in particular string S1, okay? But I'm not assigning to the another string. So 
so can you see here this is not added in the string because i have not assigned to the another string s2 okay because i'm just trying to add some value in particular uh, string right i'm adding the s1 but it will be you can print this one while you are adding it but you cannot restore it you cannot override it okay so you have to assign another new string and that is string new string you have to print okay so this is the example here like s1 or s1 you can do like um, okay so you are same string in the same there you are not modifying but you are appending it okay so here you are comparing the string object by equal right the by default is a string having the two functions like equal or hash code okay same like a java okay so it is going to compare like whether the string is the same or not so it will be using the equal or hash code okay so you are modifying so it will point to the new string this s1 is point to now new string So sometimes we do the comparison, right? So how we can say this string is same or not, this string is same or not. So if there are the multiple strings are there, so here the values are same, okay? But S1 is an S2, the values are not same, okay? So when the values are not same, it will give false. And when values are same, it will be giving true, right? The values are same, okay? Some string functions are there, equals also we can check. So this and this same way, like we can, uh, check the values okay and java but s1 s2 will not be the same because there is a object okay so there it will create altogether a new reference and uh, it will uh, equals function only you can use to check but here if you are using double equal that is also true okay that is true here okay and here if you use equals so equal will definitely give true because s2 and s3 both are same but s1 s2 both are not same so it will give the false okay compare two function is there so compare two function check if the if s1 is uh, like a greater string right s2 right so it will be positive number if it is less it will be negative number if both are same it will be giving the zero so it returns the positive number difference of the character value okay so wherever they find the difference of the character value, it will give the positive, okay? So it will be checking both the string and then give the accordingly the result of the compare to, okay? Concatenation is there. Concatenation is a plus operator sign, okay? In any other programming languages, uh, plus sign is there to concatenation. Concat two strings, so we can do concat, okay? Concat function also there. Okay, substring is there. Substring is getting the string out of the string, right? Suppose I want to get some part of the string. So the index, I can give the first index and last index. So it will take it out the string, okay? So if I'm doing here zero to five, so it will start zero and five, okay? So it will take it five character out, okay? So we can get it to the substring, okay? Okay, string interpolation study I told about. Like we can use uh, if I'm if I'm just directly printing this pi okay so here I'm not using any s keyword but I want to use it this pi inside the double quote so I will use s here and I will put it dollar symbol okay if you check here I will be using the interpolation string okay so here I'm using s and I'm using dollar pi so why it is useful suppose you are writing multiple values in the double code string you want to replace it you know right in python there is a format is there right we can define uh, multiple values using format and we can set the values so in the scala we can use interpolation string and then multiple dollar symbol values we can write anywhere suppose i say here and my new value equal to dollar p1 so this is one value this is a different value so two values can be added with the complete whole string 
But the same thing if you do without interpolation, so what you need to do, you have to do plus and then double code again, start, and then again, you have to write and you have to maintain the spacing also. Okay. But here is using interpolation, you can write the whole string, just replace your placeholders using dollar variable, you can replace. Okay. So it will replace the value of your variable using the dollar variable. Okay. It will replace. Okay. This is the same example. Okay. If your decimal values is there, so you can use the float. Okay. And float is covering the your string as well as float. Okay. So you can display the value. You have multiple values are there, S1 and version. So you are replacing here the values. Okay. So raw is also there, right? You want to as it is, you want to print something. So you can use the raw. So you can print it as it is. Okay. Okay. Now next thing is the exception handling. So exception handling is a very important part of any programming language. Okay. Because if you are not doing the proper exception handling, so our program once uh, error comes, so it will be halt and we will come out. So what I want, like I my program should not be stopped. It should keep continue. I should get my error message and my program should not stop. So generally when you are writing a very long code, right? Very, very lengthy codes, right? So there you don't want to stop your execution, but you need to do the exception handling. So exception handling, there are the exception clause are there, right? Exception, try, catch. Okay, we have a try, catch, and we have a finally, we have a throw, throws. So these are the keywords are there, how to handle the exception. So if I say I'm creating a one class, I'm giving a name exception example, and I define the divide function. So A divide by B, okay, because I'm doing the A divide by B, A I'm dividing by B, okay? And after dividing, a divided by B, I'm printing the rest of the line of code in the same function. Okay. So when I write it, uh, I'm not using any try catch here. So my program giving my error because I'm passing the value zero. So when I give the zero value, it will give me the exception, arithmetic exception, because number divided by zero is the arithmetic exception. Okay. So So I will get arithmetic exception number divided by zero. So I'm getting the exception and my program came out, right? I'm, I just came out from my program. So I'm not continuing my program, but it's still I want to continue. So I have to do my try catch exception handling. So simply what I need to do, where A divided by the whatever part of the function, which is, uh, which is required uh, exception handling. So you will be doing try A divided by V catch, so here little change is there in the exception handling in Scala as compared to Java. So in Java, you write in the catch, in the bracket, you write exception, you write like this, exception E, like this you write, okay? And then you use the, uh, you define E dot print stack test. But in the in Scala, But in Scala, you are simply defining catch and then you are not giving any round bracket. You are simply saying case. So here we are using the pattern matching. Whatever type of exception object come, it will handle that one, okay? So right now I know this A divided by Y is uh, arithmetic exception. So I'm printing only arithmetic exception. But suppose this particular try catch is having, can have multiple exceptions. So I can write a multiple catch. I can write in the case, multiple case, I can write in the same catch. Okay. I will show that one. So rest of the code is executing. So if I'm running this code, so you will see the difference. Like after coming the exception, your program is not stopped. So when you run this, So rest of the code is executing. So this line is printing. Okay, so you, you came to the catch block and you print this print ln exception and then you continued your, your next further statement. Okay, 
So this is the way like handle the exceptions, like you can handle the errors exceptions in the Scala. Okay. So concept is same, like they are also using the try catch. But here's the scenario, you can have uh, any exception may come. Suppose you are giving a value 100 comma zero. So which exception will come? So you are doing first A divided by B, zero, A divided by B. So you will get the arithmetic exception. But suppose you are not giving the second value zero. So you will get the array because you are trying here, creating an array of two numbers, but you are printing array of 10. So then it is an index out of bound exception, okay? So if you are no, right, this particular exception is this particular type. So you can make a case of those exception. And if you have no exception is caught, right, by this case, so it will print the provable, right? It will actual whatever exception, like it will print, okay? So you can define this multiple case. So here is you can, you don't need to define the multiple catch. Okay, like Java, you have a multiple catch and then you are defining one exception in a one catch. Okay, or there is in Java 7, they have introduced one catch can have multiple exception by pipe sign. Okay, but in Scala, you can have a case. Okay, so you have to define the exception using the case. So you are getting array index out of even this is this message you you are saying found unknown exception but actual exception is this array index out of bound exception so it is saying this 10 is a the index it is not able to recognize because this index is not part of this array okay so it is giving this exception and the rest of the code is working so this is the way how to catch multiple exception in a same try catch like hey, how can you define if any one of the exception can throw okay so you can you can rethrow the exception or you can call some exception class also even you can write your own exception class right suppose i want to give my own custom message rather than giving this uh, print stack message i want to give my own custom message so you can call your own custom exception class Okay, so that I also show how to create your own exception class. Okay, so there is a one finally block is there. What is the use of finally? We here in the Java also finally. So finally is a block which will be always executed. Whether your exception comes or your exception doesn't come, your finally block will be executed. So the use of finally block is you can clean the resources. Suppose you have started some file object or you have created some connection, JDBC connection. And uh, if suppose some exception comes, you come in the catch block. So you are not able to close your resources, right? So finally block, you can close your resources, whatever uh, resources you have opened, like JDBC connection, file connection. So all those file handler, so you can close it. Otherwise it will be giving you the memory leak problem. Okay, because uh, if the the connection is not closed, so it will be consuming your memory. Okay, so generally the finally block, the main purpose of the finally is whether your exception comes or doesn't come, it will always execute it. Okay, so rather than writing, either two ways you can do close the resources. Either you can write here, suppose your file object is there and you are saying file dot close. Okay, file one dot close. Okay, or you have to write you have to write here also because you don't know uh, in the catch block also you are writing okay so here also you are doing so writing two multiple places better is like we can write in the finally if this is statement if i write it finally so whether my exception comes or not so my this finally will be always executed and it will it will do okay so i can comment these two so i don't need to so i can use uh, finally for whether my exception comes or not, it will be executed, okay? So finally will be executed. So finally block uses uh, to close your uh, file handler or some connection object, you can close it. So Scala having a throw keyword. So there are the two keywords are there. One is a throw and one is a throws, okay? 
तो थ्रो इज यूज राइट वेन आई वॉन्ट टू थ्रो एक्सेप्शन फोर्सफुली फोर्सफुली आई वॉन्ट टू थ्रो द एक्सेप्शन आई नो द कंडीशन दिस पर्टिकुलर कंडीशन वेन कम आई वॉन्ट टू थ्रो सम एक्सेप्शन ओके सो यू कैन राइट योर कस्टम एक्सेप्शन हेयर और यू कैन डिफाइन सम सिस्टम एक्सेप्शन ओके सो हेयर आई एम गिविंग अ कंडीशन इफ द एज दिस वैलिडेट फंक्शन इज यूजिंग दिस कंडीशन इफ एज इज लेस देन एटीन आई वॉन्ट टू give this masses i want to give this masses you are not eligible or else you are eligible so in the throw here i am throwing this exception explicitly okay so when i validate method will call and i'm passing the value 10 and when i check here age is less than 18 so it will throw this exception okay so throw is used to throw one exception at a time okay so you know that so you can see here you are not eligible but this exception is wrong arithmetic exception just for testing purpose i have written here the arithmetic exception but you can uh, return some your custom exception you can write your own custom exception and that exception you can throw okay and the throw okay so this is the one and uh, custom exception how to write you have to define your custom exception by defining the extend keyword right you can you can uh, extend the exception class this is a top level class okay in the hierarchy throwable is a very very top class and after that throwable there is a exception class the same hierarchy in the java one and extend exception and it is uh, this extend exception this is uh, extending from the exception and then we can uh, we we can use this string as a input right to this exception for writing our custom exception messages so what i can do here i am calling the validate function same function i am calling okay and here i am calling this my custom exception here okay so throw keyword i am just throwing this custom exception and not eligible right so this custom exception message will be thrown so it will not throw any other system exception this is my own exception class okay so you will get the message like this invalid age exception okay so throws keyword is used when we are not sure how many exception can be thrown any one of the exception can be thrown i can use throws keyword suppose i know okay this particular code this particular function can throw two different exceptions right so i can define in the throws keyword so either you keep it in the try catch or you can here you can write the throws on the function on the top you can define the multiple exception so any one exception any one of the exception is uh, uh, is going to thrown so it will be thrown and if you want to define a custom exception like you want to throw explicitly so we can use throw keyword okay so this is the difference between the throw and throws okay so we can define either throw or throws depending on the requirement okay so this is clear this the exception handling so how to create our exception class what is the throw throws okay finally and uh, try catch multiple uh, cases we can define how to catch the exceptions and uh, how to handle the exceptions by using the try catch okay okay next thing is the uh, collections okay so collection um, there is a rich set of library is there in scala okay so we know the there are the different collections which are very very frequently used list set map okay these are the three most uh, frequently used collections okay but there are many more other collections also there those are used also in scala so collections there are the two types of categories of the collections in scala immutable and mutable collection so mutable collections right you can modify immutable collection you cannot modify okay so when you see the hierarchy of the collection the top level we have a traversal is a trait okay and from traversal we have 
So there are two types of uh, uh, like like first first is the top level is a trade is there traversal and iterable is a, another trade which is extending from the traversal and then we have a three trades are there okay so these three trades are set sequence and map set and sequence these are the two for single element collection okay like you are storing the collection as a single element okay but map is a key value pair type. So generally you see the collection category, it is divided into the two parts. One is a single element collection, okay? And one is a um, key value pair kind of collection, okay? So if you see set, sequence, these are the two uh, single element and map is a key value pair. When I go to the set, set has further three implementation classes, okay? Has set, these are the abstract classes. These are the abstract classes. And these classes you will be inherited, like automatically inherited in your, uh, when you are using object and when you are using SDK, Scala SDK you are using, so you will be getting these libraries. So hash set is uh, using hashing function and hashing like uh, it's uh, uh, setting the value or that's the reason it is not allowing duplicate. How it can identify the value is duplicate or not in hash set because of hashing, because of uh, hash function and that is supported by the hash set, okay? So hash set is supporting the, um, the, the functionality of the hashing so that it cannot allow the duplicate. So complete set is the, which is not allowing the duplicate. Even not hash set, the set is the function, set is a collection which is not allowed duplicate. So all the set is basically not allowing the duplicate, whether it's a hash set, bis set, list set, sorted set, preset, okay? When we come to the sequence, so sequence is a category where uh, like we have the other two types are there, index sequence and linear sequence. And further we have vector and this one list, stream, queue, stack. So these are the collections, like linked list type of collections are there. So linear sequence collections. And map is a key value pair. We have a hash map and list map. And the sorted map is a one trait and which is extended by tree map. Okay, so here the order is maintained. The keys order will be alphabetically. That is the only difference. So here is a tree set and sorted set. This is basically maintaining the order of the element. Okay, otherwise set is not ordered. Set is not ordered. So set is unordered collection and uh, list and these collection also unordered. Okay, but you want to make, make it your set as a order. List is the order collection. List is the order because in which order you are inserting element, the same order you can get it. Okay. But sorted set, uh, set is not ordered, but you can make it by using the tree set and sorted set. And same map is not ordered, hash map is not ordered, but you can use sorted map, tree map to make it order. Okay. So there are the some library functions are there, which are the common uh, function for across all the collections. Those are common to all collections. So it is not specific to any collection. It is common to all collection. So hat function is there, init is there, like you want to initialize some collection, some set of elements. So you can use the init, empty, you can check last value, max value, min value, size. You want to add all the element, you want to do some, some function is there, or you can convert to array, list, sequence, these are the converting to the one type to another type, okay? So depending on the use case, you can use this set of library functions of the collections, okay? So first is a set. So set is uh, always store the unique element in the set. It doesn't maintain any order. It's uh, unordered, okay? So when I'm creating set, so empty set, you have to use a round bracket to create set, okay? So you can use set and bracket, and then you can specify your element. Okay, so it will, even if you are giving any duplicate element, but it will make it one copy. So it will override the existing value. It will override the existing value. So when you, it is not copied.
Okay. Can you see here? I'm not getting a duplicate value of goal. I'm not getting right because uh, it will be always giving you the unique values because it's using the unique unique element. Okay. If you want to get the head tail is empty, so you can get the values. So tail will be giving you accept your first value. It will give the values in the tail. Does it return the values or that? Uh, what Richard you asking? Does it the set? Does it return the values or that the set? Like A B C. Like C before C before F before H before golf. In order. Of. So order will not be maintained here, right? If you see. The set. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. Because because set is already unordered, right? Type, but when you are using preset, it will maintain order. Okay, that will come. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. And how can you merge two set? So suppose I have a one is games, one is alphabet. I want to merge it. Okay. So I can by using plus plus sign in between these two set, I can merge it. Okay. So. These are the straightforward one. You can directly run those program code and then you can see the result. In object of main. So here is, you are not getting the order, unordered way is coming. It's not the same order. So merging is doing, so it is doing the merging of the four and five element. Total is a nine element. So it is showing the after merging, okay? So this is the example of how can you merge the two sets Okay, two different sets and you can check contains. This is very useful one. Generally, sometimes uh, I want to verify some value is present in my set or not. So contains is there. Like same contains key is there for the map. So same here set having contains. So any particular element you can check whether it's uh, um, present or not. Okay, so that we can do. And uh, if I want to add a new element. Suppose my set is already having some set of element, but I want to add extra element. So I can use plus sign, okay, adding new element. So even if you're trying a duplicate element to add again, so it will not add one more time. So it will be remain there, same element. And if you want to remove, so minus equal is there. So you can remove. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Do you always have to uh, import the scale or import it once? Yeah, if the import is needed, right? See, this the is import, no. in the, this is, it one, is, it, is it once for the session or all the time? Each time you run it? No, this this I don't need to do again because I have already done once, right? So I don't need to do. Okay. So if I do it, this it will work also because I have already done once because I'm copy pasting code. So it is coming part of the copy okay otherwise i don't need to do again again exactly. this, exactly. this import will remain there till this session once this session is closed okay when i close this window okay then i have to do import all again, again. correct correct okay. correct so i don't need to do again import it. so it is coming in the part of copy okay so because here import is mandatory right if i'm not doing this import because this is a shell here because this is a uh, we have to tell which uh, package our class libraries are there, okay? So this is a lazy loading. It is not doing all the things, right? All the package library, okay? So whenever you need it something, you use import statement, okay? But when you are writing the code in the IntelliJ, so you can do on the top or anywhere you can do, so it will do the import. There also you need import, okay? So this is same code in the, object right the same like we what we write it in the editor okay but here is a quick way like we can test right because in the in the id we have to create every time a new new object because same object we can't create or we have to add in the same main object right main function the copy paste the code then we can test
So first you see the what the code is like, then you try to write your own code, right? So you can do the practice of writing code. Okay, first you see and understand how to define set, how to define list, map, all these collections. Okay. Okay, so so this is uh, like we can iterate it. Like one way is for loop. So this thing we already seen, like how to iterate the collection, how to iterate the uh, list of values. Okay, how can we iterate? Another way is the for each. So for each also we can use here. Okay, so for each and then we can use lambda. So when you are using for each, then it will come lambda. Okay, so you can do for each. But in for each, you can do some more additional, like you can add, right? Suppose I want to add new green. So every element I want to add this string. Okay, so we can do this. Okay, I will show one map function also there. So, but map cannot print. Map is just doing operation, one to one operation. That is also doing one to one. It will pick the one element and doing the operation. So, map is a harder function. So, we can use any collection dot map, and then I can use lambda. So, I can write like this. Suppose my collection name is map. Okay, okay. Um, collection name is a games. Okay, then I call map. And I say lambda x x okay. And now I say I want to print ln. I want to I say x plus new gain. But this map is a transformation here, and here for each is an action. Okay. Oh, print and it is coming the same result, right? Same result is coming. Okay. But map is a transformation and for each action. Okay. I have, uh, these are two sets are there. So I want to do intersection union. So it is easy by using the union function is there, intersect intersect is there. So it will find, we know the definition of union intersection. So union is uh, all element together in a one single collection and intersect is uh, the common element between these two. So we we'll get it, okay. Okay, this is sorted set. So here are the duplicate, uh, Sorted set. Yeah, two is two time. So let's see this one. If I'm creating a sorted set. No. So only one one time the values are coming. Right? So sorted set is giving. S set is uh, basically extend abstract set and immutable set interface. Okay. And uh, hash set is use the hash. Okay. So it is also not allowing duplicate. Okay. So we have created hash set store and for each. Okay. So this is has set. Okay. Bit set. Bit set is uh, working like a bit memory, right? 
okay bit set is uh, more compact okay and it is generally this uh, bit set is not used okay but if we have uh, uh, a special kind of set used for the storing non negative integer in compact way so then we can go for the base set okay but if you see as a direct internally it is internally storing because we are not able to know right if your data is very huge in our collection then we can go for bit set otherwise uh, we will not see any difference whether we go for bit set or hash set or set it doesn't mean any difference okay so for the less element is no uh, use okay okay so list set okay that is another version of uh, it's a combination of list and set okay that is a list set and uh, list set class implement input, uh, immutable okay elements are stored internally in the reverse insertion order okay by default the set is not ordered but here this list is having ordered collection right list is ordered so that's the reason this list set is ordered but still the elements are unique because list doesn't allow unique list allows duplicate okay so here the set is using unique element but with the order like insertion order of the reverse or insertion order okay so you will see here like when you are creating a list set so it will be when you are using as a list so it can allow duplicate but list set will not allow duplicate but it will maintain the order so that's the difference list set and list okay so that is the difference So operations will be the same like you can add element or you can remove element plus sign minus sign you can do okay so next category is uh, in the scala for the collections right one is a set and one another one is a sequence so sequence is uh, one other type of collection where you can store the values as a sequence as a num uh, set of elements and you can create a sequence of any type a string type or integer type so you can you can specify value here string so this will become as a type is sequence of a string if your values are integer values this sequence will become as a sequence integer so type is not mandatory type is automatically uh, taken by the variable okay so we can iterate it the sequence element by using the lambda this is the for each or we can use map or any other transformation functions we can use can you okay. have a mixed Hmm? Can you list? have mixed type? Yes, maybe int, int and uh, and uh, and string within the list. Do you mean to say, the sequence? Like uh, you want here this as a list. Yeah. List and uh, okay, I don't give the type. Okay, it should take okay. it, and I should define here list. Yeah. And I say this is my list. I want to iterate. And uh, because list and sequence both come in the same category. I understand, okay. but, the, but the, list contain, the list contains string and int. List extend? No, 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 list, in the list we have, we have integers and string. Mm -hmm. Can we? Oh, both. Okay, yes. okay. You cannot do in list, you can use tuple, right? In that case, you can use tuple. So tuple is a, uh, like, well, data type where you can keep it mix uh, type of values so how right. to define the tuple you can say where tup and then the bracket you say okay two is there three is there and you say hello is there mm -hmm. okay. i will tell about this so this one you can create tuple. Can't, you can't do it in list yeah okay so you mean to say but yes. list you have to okay okay you want to say okay Correct. I think mutable list. It's but it is a type any because generally the list is a generally we say okay same type of values. Okay, you know any is a data type which is very very flexible, right? So where you are getting the mixed type of data, so your data type cannot fix there, right? The data type automatically change here any because it is automatically detected because tuple it is fine because tuple has the nature tuple has a nature whether you give the same type or different type it it it, it is all acceptable but list is a default is same data type 
but when you are trying when you are trying like a different data type values in the list it will create list but it will give the any type okay so it will allow list is allowing okay but generally list case and array array is always uh, okay if i try array here array is, array is one case no array will return an error though one case well, it, it is also so here in uh, it is not like in java right like any one type you define then you cannot use the another type like in, is, uh, like, in, there, like in like in python lists can be mixed so same thing is here right but here data type is any automatically the type is coming any because oh. here is a mixed data type but well, it doesn't have to be you know you know it doesn't have to be tuple in, in python tuple is there in python also <laughs> i understand i understand but this mm. the list stands by itself list can be mixed yeah yeah but tuple and list both having its own use cases okay tuple tuple you have a very easy to access element like you can use any tuple you can say tup dot underscore one correct okay print we have to do so we can we can access the element hmm. i think up to iterate it okay so i can i can access the element by the the underscore like first value second value like this i can access okay so so tuple i can easily access uh, element okay and tuple is uh, like you can use uh, like some function which is returning two different value and you don't want to create a list which one you will go tuple is a good choice okay right. you will do one thing suppose my function is uh, i'm saying here like you are getting x comma y value okay and then you are saying equal suppose my function is my function okay and my function i'm gi giving some value four suppose i'm passing this function four but it is returning the tuple type values mm -hmm. so x will automatically take the first value and y will take the second value second values. okay so if tuple is not there so what is the other way you will do list right but list again you have to iterate with the numbers right you have to the first value uh, and second value okay so even you have a two parameter but you have to create a list but here is if two parameters simply x comma y and x will get one value y is getting second value okay. so when you have function return with more than one values you can go easily with tuple oh, okay. okay thank you same thing is there in the python also tuple right okay okay so another collection is a uh, vector okay so here okay we go into a sequence okay so vector is a uh, vector list all this coming in the one category sequence okay so vector is uh, immutable data structure same like a uh, um, sequence okay and here is just vector we are creating a list of values we are creating as a but type is a vector so we are using round bracket and defining values but what type of collection it is it's a vector of int type vector of int type so i can do the other functions on directly on the vector okay so we can define the iterating the element on those i can add the one vector to another vector by merging two vectors so i can merge okay so these are the common one and the list list i'm creating and this is a list two. I'm creating one list to another list, right? Okay, list is this list, and this is a either I define the type or I don't define the type. It will automatically take whatever values is there. If it is a different types of values are there, so it will take it all those the, any type. Otherwise, it will take whatever type of values are there. Okay. <clears throat> so list I can do the operations like a uh, merging operation and hat tail anything i can do okay and i can find with the index suppose i want to search any element with the index i can do with the value i can search also so i can get the list of two so i can get the this two is on the which index it is there okay now i'm giving an index value here so i accessing the element of the second index so i can get the zero one two so this list indexing will be starting from the zero. So zero, one, two, the five will give this two, okay? So we can merge two list, okay? We can merge the two list by plus plus operation. We can make it sorted also. 
I want to make it sorting order of the list elements. So sort it. So these are the ready-made functions you can directly use and you can, <coughs> or otherwise you can create a, another empty list and then you can iterate the element of the list and then you can write append. You can append the element. So that is a manual way of writing the sort function or reverse you want to do, you can do. Q is first in, first out. So element coming in the queue, which will be coming first, that will be going out first, okay? So Q is maintaining the first in, first out and stack is last in, first out. So these are the two data structure, right? Q and stack. So Q is first in, first out, stack is the last in, first out. So Q is uh, the number of element we can define the Q, okay? And Q we can print also, print Q and Q2, okay? If I want to get the first element in the Q, Okay, so Q dot front. Okay, so first element I can take it. Okay, so some little bit change in the function names. Okay, so you can NQ, you want to add the last of the Q because you cannot add in the middle, right? Because Q has a limitation, right? You can add only the last, right? So NQ, NQ you can do. Okay, so first element in the Q and you want to take it delete element in the Q, so DQ. Okay, so Q and Q, first element in the Q, so you can get it, like you can take it out uh, element, okay, so when you have one, five, this one, and when you are adding the element, so it will be adding in the last, okay, and when you want to DQ this one, okay, so you will be get, getting out the, from the beginning, okay, so that is a difference. A stream is uh, also kind of lazy list, okay, a stream is a lazy list. So a stream is uh, like when you are getting the elements continuously, okay, so you can define the stream basically. So these are the element and you can define a stream. You can do like map function, you can do each element of a stream you want to multiply to. So you can do like all element you can multiply to or you want to take 10 element of the stream. So you have these functions to get the values. Okay. One to 10 element you want to define the stream. Okay. So you can create a stream for these are the type of scenarios you can create a stream. Okay. Map is key value pair. So when you define a key and value, right? So key is used to retrieve the value and key should be unique. So when the same key is coming again, right? When you are inserting data, so it will override the value of existing key, right? Okay, so suppose second time you are writing a, a with any other word, so that that will override this apple, okay? So you, how to create a map? So here is little change in the map is a map keyword and you have to give in the bracket. So two ways you can create. One is hyphen greater than sign, you can use the delimiter character between the key and value. This way you can create key value pair or comma separated, you can define key value pair in the separate, separate bracket. Okay, so you can define the map. So empty map you want to create, so this will create an empty map, map.empty, okay. Like set.empty, so you can create an empty set, empty list, so you can create, okay. And uh, you can add so the element. The, element. So what's the difference when the Difference between? Between that. There are two ways of creating map now. What's, is there any okay, difference? Is nothing. No, no, no difference. Actually, this is just a way of writing. Okay, two ways. Okay, it's nothing difference because internally, oh, okay. what we'll be doing, but it is uh, final way. It's uh, you are getting the map. Okay, it's a two way of uh, way of writing. Which way you find easy or good, right? You can do. Okay. Or we can write for loop also, and then we can define as a variable. Okay, we can add the values in the map, okay, dynamically. Okay. If you want to access any key of your map, map of key you give. So you will get the value of that particular key. Okay, if you want to add any new element, so this is, again, we are adding a new element. So this way we are adding arrow sign we are using. Okay, if you want to remove the element from the map for a particular key, so you can give the key. So it will remove that key value pair. Okay. So hash map is uh, another class. Okay. 
so hash map is used to store the element as a key value but it used the key for hashing okay it used hash code to store the element and return a map so here is also the same way but you are using the hash map type it's a hash map so java is also hash map so same hash map is here key value pair so how to iterate a map so if you want to dynamically iterate the values you may have 100 values 20 values 10 values you want to iterate all the values so for each is there but here you have to use case if you are using any collection you just use lambda you just write x arrow x like like this you are writing and then you are writing your print ln x if it is a single element but it is having two element key and value so you have to use case here and then individual element you can print okay so this is a way of using uh, iterate how to use it how to iterate the hash map using the for each okay so if you want to add element and then again you want to check it you can print it Okay, so after adding the value, so you are getting the new element. Excuse me, excuse me. The, the key values has to be unique, right? Oh, key is unique, right? If you're trying to uh, write the same key again, so it will override the value. Okay, let's try this. In the case that you have uh, maybe 20, 100 uh, elements per se. 20, 100 elements? Mm -hmm. I don't know. As mean you have uh, a lot, a lot of elements, but more than ten, maybe. But in any case, there's no. You cannot have duplicates anyway. Or how do you know? It doesn't want you. It doesn't want you when you do. Instead of overwriting, does it want you? It cannot have the duplicate. Duplicate of what key? No, no. Uh, yes. Instead of overwriting the key, does it give you a warning? Duplicate no, no. Warning. Okay, okay, okay. You mean to say uh, warning? It's not like an error handling thing. Okay, that yeah, thing because you may, 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 may not know. You may not know that, that part thing. is a developer part. That is a developer part, right? Developer has to when you are writing a code. So you check contains key. If you are contains key is giving you true, then only you add the element. Okay, so otherwise you don't. Have add element so that's the developer responsibility right to check the condition okay whether yeah This is a different output. This is a different output. Okay, so D is replaced with the this doll one, right? So this value is overridden. Hmm. Okay, so list map is there. So list map is uh, having a list like maintaining the order in the insertion order in the key. Okay, so we can maintain the insertion order in the key. By default, the order is not maintained by the map and the set. So when you want to maintain the order, right? So you can use either list set or if you have a key value pair type, you have you have to use list map. So you can use these. Okay. So what is a tuple? So tuple is a you have. A, different uh, data types or same data types like you can use a round bracket and you can define but you don't no need to give any type here right other one you have to give type right so that's the difference so you are defining the tuple just give the round bracket you are giving the values and it will be taking whether it's a same type or different data type okay so it will accept and this one will be giving you these on many different different tuple so i'm
okay so just i am getting as it is tuple okay but how to iterate the tuple values okay suppose i have defined one tuple so i have to use i cannot directly do the for each i have to do product iterator okay so tuple doesn't have direct for each it has a product iterator dot for each and then i can do print ln but if i want to access individual element of tuple so i can use dot that particular tuple dot underscore one underscore two okay so underscore one will be first value second value and then underscore three so if i write it so here is just remember the index is starting from the one two three so here is one two three underscore one two three and so i am iterating the values so it will iterate all the values because it's a loop right okay it's a loop okay and here i am getting specific values i don't want to iterate all the values i want to get the last value i want to get the first value so i want to iterate but here is a limitation is there 22 i think in the newer version they change or not but 22 element you can define in the tuple max 22 so maybe in the latest version they have changed or not that limit so it has uh, 22 limit of the limit of elements so, uh, two only has the till tuple to do we can create tuple of maximum two element 20, 22 element Scala two point even in the Scala three twenty two limit for tuple is removed by the introducing tuple XSL. Now we can have the tuple with more than twenty two element, but that is in the tuple or oh, Scala three X version. So we are using two point X. 2.30 in 2.12 okay so that limit is still not improved there but in the three x they have improved that limit so it's number of elements hmm? how do you directly access access the last element in a top in this top woman in any top the very last element if you if you want but to last element you have to find the size first and get the element okay because there is no index where we cannot know right so suppose yes. i say correct so if I find the size, size we can have every every collection has the size, right? So I know the size is there. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. It's not like uh, you use minus one for the last one and zero for the first, no. But it is starting from the one. So whatever size comes, so that you can directly access because it is not starting from zero. If you are using list, right? You want to get then last element will be minus one. Minus one, yes. But tuple has, uh, like, a, there is a starting from the one. Okay. So tuple, like suppose this is the example I was telling you. Uh, when I'm not sure, right? Okay, like okay, how many values can return, right? Okay, so here is a one function tuple. So this is the uh, I'm returning a tuple object. So this tuple, how many values are there? Three. So all three values are returning one, two point five, and this one. So I'm not defining any specific values like x comma y. Suppose I know only two values are there. So I can say two values and uh, both the values i can take it in that x comma y but here i'm not sure right how many values can return so i'm defining just variable and this variable will take it entire tuple okay and then i can get it whatever value i want i can iterate it okay so here when your function is uh, returning more than one values okay so we can use the tuple we can return tuple okay so when I'm sure like, okay, how many number of values are there? I can get it. I can get it those values. Okay. But when I'm not sure, so I can take it complete list of values and then I can iterate. So here. And I can access by minus one minus uh, dot underscore one dot underscore two i can access the value if i don't want to iterate all the values i can access 
because I know first value will be underscore one, second value will be underscore two, like this we can access. Okay, is it clear this collection? So next is uh, file handling. Okay, 10 minute break I do. Okay, then I, I start the file handling.
Hi guys, are you getting my voice? Louder. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's start the Scala file handling. Okay. So file handling is like when only we write the file or read the file or update the file. Okay. So we can write a file using the file object. Okay. So Scala file handling. We have to use this package scala.io.source. Okay. So there is a class source source class having a method from file. So whatever file name you gave, it will create a one file object. Okay. So we have the API is also new file, right? This way also we can do, right? We can write a file input output. Okay. So file input output, uh, uh, like I can create a file object and then I can use print writer and I can pass the print writer this and I can write function to write something in the file. So I can do that in the, so when I create any file, I can, I can uh, read the file using the source IO package. Okay. So for reading the file, so we can read the file. So. So this file will be created. If I'm not giving the path, it will create in the same folder where my Scala shell is there. Okay, so it will create. So simply I'm giving a file, reading the file also, I'm giving the same Scala file, whatever file I want to read. Okay, I didn't use the import, so I got the error. So here I'm getting all characters, right? From file, and then I'm doing has next. So this is iteration I'm doing. So it is reading character by character. Okay. So line is there. You can get the get line. The so same thing here, like whatever file source you get. So if you do get line, you will get the list. And then you can get each line as a value of list. Okay. So you can iterate the list of lines. Okay. And you can get each line. So when I run this. So only one line is there. So you are having one line is coming. So this way you can read and you can do some manipulation on the data, right? And then again, write into the another new file or you can update the existing file. So you can do the right operation you can do. Okay, so you can create a, another new file like a, a Scala file one.txt. And then this, this content, you can pass it here. So whatever line you want to pass, you can write it in the so, so you have to i think that, that code you can do while you are iterating the file and this is the code for creating a file new file so you can paste it inside Here is, uh, I have to create a new file where I want to write uh, this output. So I will create this file object. So this statement, this statement, I will write it inside the loop. So I will, I will pass the line here. So dynamically it will.
again you want to check it so you have to do file name I can give this file which I want to read. getting empty. Writing back. So I have to use uh, this print LN. We have to use print LN. Okay, so file is uh, this. Okay, this this code is already there, right? So we don't need to write this is going back to. This print writer is for this one, the Scala file one. Yeah, but, but the Val file source one, though. What, what? Scala file one. Yeah, so that's why I want from. So this line I'm reading for this particular source. Okay, first we check the, whether the file is written or not. Okay. It is. Uh, you, you created the file, but you're not writing to it. Are you? Oh, this is empty file I'm reading. Yes, pretty, yes. You put an empty file, yes. Okay, okay. So empty will write empty. So, right. so I have, uh, so this one is, uh, I should not use this. I should use the existing file. Correct. Okay, just in file, and and here I'm writing into the. Yes, this yes, is the. Yes, uh, hmm. hmm. So the file one is, the Scala file one is showing the result. But we have to check uh, our uh, new file because we have written the data into the new one. So here will come the Scala file one only. This will be coming a new one only. But yeah, here but I'm writing in the new one. I'm writing in the new one. But, but you, you check it on the last line here though. So print writer, I took it for the this one. Okay, right line. And this is a file source, file name. Okay. So Scala file has the data, right? But we have to check uh, Scala file one. So Scala file one, this print writer, I'm writing the line here.
see scala file one is also there why it is not reading if i do what is in the toss uh, edit command no edit is not there okay so here in the Yeah, content is there. File is having the content. Right. Okay. And this we are saying print ln line. Yeah. Even if I remove all this code, I just simply say Scala file one. And the name is correct, Scala file one dot txt. So it is writing the content, but we are not able to read okay. yeah it is there so it is reading okay so when we are writing the content from one file to another file, so we can use dynamically here. We can write it. So print writer, we can write uh, into another file. Okay. So next is uh, multi-threading. Okay. So Scala also having a support of multi-threading, same like Java is having multi-threading. So what is the multi-threading concept? So multi-threading is a process of executing multiple threads simultaneously. So for concurrent process, we use multi-threading. Like I want to, uh, generally the thread is called when the some part of your program is running in the process that is called thread. So your program can be divided into the number of threads and these threads will be running concurrently. So thread having the life cycle. So what is the thread life cycle? So whenever a new thread start, it will be in the new state and it is coming into the immediately runnable state. So runnable state will automatically come when you start the thread dot start. When you start thread dot start, your 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 thread will come in runnable. Runnable is a state where it is ready to run. It is going to start run. Okay, and the next step is a run. Okay, so run function will auto. Uh, yeah, you you are asking something. So run function will be called automatically when you start the thread, because after some second of time, right, it will start run. Run, you don't need to call manually run, okay? So there are the other different states are there, non-runnable terminated state is there. So thread can go into the sleep also, right? Like you can, uh, like uh, doing some IO operations, right? So you can do sleep, okay? So run will go to the, um, I O uh, like when you are doing again, again, it will come back to the sleep is having a some time. Okay. Suppose you say here three dot sleep. Okay. And you give in thousand second, thousand millisecond. So that is one second after one second, again, it will come back into the runnable and then again running state. Okay. So other state is uh, um, like terminated state, like when the thread will completely executed then it will come automatically terminated, okay? Or we can say it can come into the dead state or we can forcefully uh, stop the thread, thread dot stop. So it will stop the thread. So there are the two ways are there to use a thread. One is extending thread class. So thread class is given by the API and by implementing the runnable class. So in the Scala, there is no interface concept. When Java is a runnable interface is there, but in uh, Scala, we have runnable class, okay? So we extend this class and override the run function, okay? So either you use a thread class extend. So what is the advantage of uh, extending thread or runnable? So in the Java, there was an advantage because multiple, like one inter multiple interfaces, like when you are using a runnable interface, so you can extend any other thread class. 
but when you are extending the thread class in java you cannot extend any other class because any one class can be extended at a time okay so here is uh, basically both our classes so uh, like we can use uh, extend thread or extend runnable we can override the run function so once we override the run function and we start the thread by t dot start so we have to create an object of the thread class this thread example class and then i'm starting the thread t dot start so it will start a one thread for this run function okay so when i run this so here is only one thread but we can create a multiple threads so main advantage of threads you can say suppose you have a file system and you want to search the file so you can create a multiple thread they can parallelly run in a different different drives and search the uh, search the files or folders parallelly okay so if you are running only single thread so the same thread will go in each and every file and uh, directories and then find the files but if you are running more than one thread so they can run parallelly so it will make execution faster so thread is basically giving the advantage of your program will be running faster okay so you are getting the message thread is running okay and if you want to create a multiple thread so you can okay if you are doing runnable so you have to pass you create a thread instance and then pass your runnable class implementation object runnable class object you have to pass then it will create a new thread instance okay okay so you can start there the, the multiple functions are there in the thread like get name you can get the name of thread you can set the thread name you can set the priority or get the priority you can check whether the thread is alive or not okay when the thread has not still finished so you can check whether thread is alive or not join function is like it will wait for one thread to another thread to start okay so join function you can define the scheduling of the thread like when the one thread is going to stop so so which thread will be going to start next so that you can define using the join so join is uh, basically starting a next thread when you are finishing the one thread okay run function is a default function right that is basically running a execution of your uh, thread okay set name set priority sleep sleep is uh, basically how many millisecond time you want to sleep your thread and then again it will come back to the run function uh, runnable state yield is here it can cause the like current higher priority thread it will give the chance first so yield is basically causes the currently executing thread to temporarily pause and allow other thread to execute if the thread priority is high right so we set here the priority so based on the priority it will if i'm using the yield function so it will allow the another thread to start okay so here in the for loop i am defining here 0 to 5 and i am running the thread for the uh, like loop for 0 to 5 and sleep i am giving so after each value to print and after that i'm going for half second to pause right i'm going in the pause i'm going i'm the blocking state i'm going and again the thread will come into runnable state and then run state so like this cycle will be there so it will be printing the value 0 0 1 1 2 2 this order can be vary also sometimes 0 0 1 2 1 1 like so um thread output is always unpredicted sometimes uh, it will be keep varying. So here I created two thread means two times loop will go zero to five, zero to five. Okay, and both the threads are started one after one, one after another. So zero came here zero zero one one so here is uh, why it is not matter because here the less loop if the loop is bigger so it can be order can be changed okay the more values are there join function is 
like i can specify t1 dot join okay t1 dot join um like next thread is a t2 will start so t2 will join then t3 will start okay so join function will be defining which thread you want to give the priority so you want to say like the sequential manner like you started t1 t2 t3 you started all but after that you said t1 dot join t2 so only t2 will start okay so join will be giving the scheduling so here is uh, <clears throat> if you see order is okay so here three threads are there so all are having 0 to 5 0 to 5 values okay so 15 times it is run set name you want to set the thread name you can use set function you can give the name of the thread like because i i'm not able to identify here this is a thread one or this thread two this is a thread three i'm not able to identify this is printed by which thread okay so i can use set name so whatever thread is uh, running it will print its own masses okay so that will be easy to recognize the output okay so with the thread name this dot that name and then i'm printing the i value okay so here you will clearly understand the output So zero one one two two per second per second. Okay, so like this output is coming. Priority, if I set the priority, so priority will take it first. Okay, so that we can check the priority also, max or main priority. Okay, we can set the main priority is zero and max is uh, ten. Okay, and uh, okay, so this is all about multi-threading. Okay, so I'm talking about now the Spark concept. Okay, the basic introduction Spark and some transformations I will do. Okay. So first uh, need to install the Spark and then uh, we can read the file. So how many APIs are there in the Spark? Okay. So first, what is a Spark? So Spark is a distributed parallel processing framework. Okay. And Spark is uh, faster than the MapReduce. We know the MapReduce is a batch processing only, but Spark is uh, batch and uh, real time both. So we have a different modules are there in the Spark core. Spark core is a base module. And base module, this has transformations and actions. So all code transformation and actions are there. So whatever transformations like map, flat map, filter, join, union, all these are the these are the all transform map, flat map, filter, join, group by key, reduce by key. These are the transformation actions are you have collect, count for each these are the action so spark is basically lazy lazy evolution is there what is lazy is there so when i'm loading up some file okay and i'm doing some transformation map flat map filter it will not immediately execute it when i'm calling any action so when i say i i have created rdd okay first we understand what is the concept of rdd data frame and data set this is a very important concept so three data structures are there in the spark okay so spark is built on top of these three data structures spark is completely built up on these three so this is a choice like i can use rdd only i can use data frame or i can use data set okay so rdd is called resilient distributed data set when the data set is distributed across the executors workers <coughs> and what is the mean of r R is resilient here. 
so what is the meaning of resilient means fault tolerance so we say rdd is a fault tolerance so why the rdd is a fault tolerance because rdd is distributed and it's recompute so whenever your rdd got failed it can recompute and it can start from the state from where it is failed so rdd is maintaining the dag direct acyclic graph so this dag is nothing but a direct acyclic graph it's a, a state of operations are there and any point of time any operation got failed it will start from the that state okay so another thing is there in the rdd is distributed so distributed means uh, it's uh, it's uh, divided into the the data into the multiple nodes or workers okay so that is distributed okay and data set is data set so rdd is a distributed and the fault tolerance and it is across the workers so it is immutable it is a what is the definition it is an immutable collection of the data collection of data which is spread across across the workers and when we do when we do any operation on rdd it will create new rdd so why they are saying the new rdd because the the it is preserving the state that's the reason they are not modifying the existing rdd so that is a design of the rdd like rdd will be keep stored like whenever you want to get the uh, like a, your p computed uh, state right or you can get it that's the reason they are not allowing to modify your any state of your rdd okay so every time you will create a new rdd internally okay new rdd and it is immutable collection of the data okay the so data frame is on other hand is a tabular representation of the data it's a tabular representation of data in the form of in the form of row and columns as table as table and you can apply your functions transformations transformation on the columns and get the result okay so why we go for data frame and when we go for the rdd rdd is used for unstructured data suppose this text file i say this text file is having any fixed number of column no right here is a one column here is a three columns here is a one column so it is completely unstructured right so when i want to read some unstructured data like text file data so text file is a unstructured form of the data okay text file is unstructured form of data when i'm reading a text file data i'm getting the rdd okay so rdd is the basic fundamental unit of spark okay you can convert rdd to data frame data frame to rdd data set you can convert to data frame so this conversions are there you can do that okay but rdd is for unstructured data and whenever you are talking about the data is here schema type of data like schema based data or data has a structured form when the data is structured form structured form then you will get data frame when you read the data when you will read the data when you will read the data you will get the data frame automatically you will get the data frame only okay so what are those structured form of the data like you can say csv file json file xml file parquet file orc file and you can say when you are reading data when you are reading data from mysql any sql database like you are reading data from no sql database no sql database cassandra mongo hbase these are the no sql database or you are reading the data from the elastic search you are reading the data from snowflake you are reading the data from um, okay what can be other stories generally the, these are the kind of stories or source and target so you can read the data from the sql databases no sql elastic search snowflake okay and uh, you have a file system data sources okay so when you are reading these all data sources they have the schemas okay because if you say my sql has the table data sql all no sql having also tables are there right collection is there in the mongo okay cassandra is having the table json xml these are having the schemas are there right csv having the fixed number of columns are there okay so these are all the 
storage like so that is the reason this comes in the spark sql so spark sql is basically api where you are reading data from different source and writing data to different target store so target store will be the same again so this is the same category of the targets okay so you should know how to read the data at the data frame from this target and how to write the data from these uh, these data store okay so this comes completely spark sql so this is completely spark sql when you are reading the data and writing the data okay and spark code deal with the transformation so you have uh, two types of actions two types of uh, uh, functions are there so what are the two types of functions transformation and action functions are transformations and actions so when we are developing any etl pipeline in spark right we have a key component like extraction transformation and load extraction hmm? okay. you asking okay so when we are doing extraction means we are reading data and we are ingesting data this data can come from any source or any form okay so once i read the data and then i will be applying the transformation so first is the extraction second one is the transformation and third one is uh, loading the data to the destination loading data to destination okay so etl pipeline here we are writing our, our own spark etl code we are writing our spark etl code this is our custom code but there are the, some ready made tools are there like talent is there informatica is there these are the ready made tools so this is having the drag and drop okay we can drag and drop component and you can design the pipeline but here in the spark etl the flexibility is you can you can define your own target you can define on source and you can write a ingestion framework you can define a ingestion framework based on the input based on input it is taking your data and pass it okay suppose you say in your property file your data is in the csv file or json file or xml file so you can write your own ingestion framework and there you can define multiple sources multiple target and then you can do ingestion and loading of the data so that kind of uh, framework you can write your own and that framework you can use for any type of data whether it's a source any type of source data or any type of target data okay so talent informatica is providing the same thing but they are the customizations you cannot do you can do but you have to write some programmatic code you have to write that way you can do okay but spark etl is completely our own custom code our own custom code custom code so you can you can make it more flexible like you can write a separate separate scala classes you can write for the one class for reader one class for writer and one class for the transformation and there you can define the different different functions like read from the csv read from parquet read from orc and same write function you can write so you have to find the matching right like okay what is the input what is the target what is the source and what is the target accordingly you can call the functions in your object okay so that kind of uh, code you can write okay so that kind of uh, ingestion framework you can write in the spark with scala you can write or even py spark also you can write so rdd is a basic fundamental unit and you are using for the unstructured form data but data frame is a tabular representation data it is used for reading data from the different data sources from which are the having the schema and which are having the structured form of the data and third one is a data set it is the extension of rdd and data frame and it is it is object object oriented style of programming of code it is object oriented style of programming code like you can use the entity here okay class type entity you can use object oriented style of programming it is a type strict api and it is using encodings for security it is using encoding of the data encoding so these are the feature of uh, data set so mostly data set like we can use when i want to implement the feature of rdd and data frame both i can go for data set so we can create a data set type of 
entities we can create, like data set we can define. Okay. So in the like when I differentiate the data frame and data set, so data frame is the one limitation. What is the limitation in the data frame? So data frame is not giving any compile time error for the logical name. Suppose your df dot column you are accessing and you are giving the wrong column name, wrong column name. So you will not get the error at the compile time. You will not get compile time error. Compile time error. But in case of in case of data set, you will get you will get compile time error. So sometimes what happens, right? You are not getting the compile time error. So it's your responsibility, right? You have to check the column name. Because if you have built the jar and you have done the Spark submit job and the job is taking too long time, right? Uh, it's at one hour, two hour job. So your all effort will go waste, right? So you will get the error on the runtime. So that will be too late, right? So you have to make sure, right? Our column name should be correct. So compile time safety is not there. So data frame doesn't have, it doesn't have compile time safety. Compile time safety. But in the data set is there on RDD also there. Okay. So these are the, this is the limitation only data frame and uh, uh, we can have a different transformation. So I will show some examples of map, flat map, filter, how to use these transformations. Okay. So first I show how to read any file. Okay. How to read a file from the, from the Spark shell. And you can write a uh, Spark code in IntelliJ IDEA. So when you are going to write an Spark shell in IntelliJ IDEA, so you can write, uh, you will be defining the Spark session. So here in the Scala shell, Spark Scala shell. So here you will get it Spark session by default. So there is a Spark session that is a wrapper of um, for starting your program. Like th there is a earlier version Spark context is there. So Spark context was there in the 2.x version. Even 3.x is using also Spark context and Spark session. Spark session. So earlier version, the Spark context is a way like to start the Spark context and configuration, and then you can start your, you can start reading the data from file, or you can create your RDD data frame, everything you can do, but you have to start with the Spark context. But in the 3.x version, even 2.x is having the Spark session, right? 2.4 version. Okay, I say this one is from 1.x to 2.x even 3.x, 2.x is having, and even 3.x is also supporting the backward compatibility is there. But Spark session came only in the 2.x and 3.x. 2.4 version or 3.x version, you will get the Spark session. So Spark session is a wrapper of, if somebody is asking you like, what is a Spark session? Spark session is a wrapper of the Spark context, SQL context, Hive context. So all they combine in a one single wrapper that is called a Spark session, and you can start your session, and then you can and and session has the one advantage, the multiple sessions you can create. But in case of context, one context can be for one program. You cannot create a multiple context. Okay, but in case of Spark session, you can create a multiple sessions together, and they can run parallelly. So that the benefit is there in the Spark session. Okay, so. When you want to read any file, anything you need a Spark session, okay. By default, this Spark session is a variable is a Spark type. The variable is a Spark. The variable name is a Spark, and this is a type of Spark session. Suppose I want to read any file, I will say Spark dot Spark context. Dot text file. So I'm reading an unstructured data. Or directly you can write using the SC, you can use also Spark context because in 3.x and 2.x version, both are there. One Spark context also there and Spark also there. Both are there. Okay. So when you say well RDD, okay, suppose I want to create a, some file and I want to read that file. I'm showing you the word count program.
So I'm just giving the name as my test. home directory my data folder is there there that file is there okay so i'm giving a file path file so when you want to read the file locally see spark can run in any environment you can run in the local environment you can want to run in the hadoop environment so there is a cluster manager comes in picture okay so what is cluster manager so there are the three types of cluster manager are there cluster manager okay so one cluster manager is a standalone standalone another one is a yarn and third one is a mesos mesos is uh, used for the different types of server okay generally mostly the deployment purpose uh, mesos server but we use standalone yarn so standalone is uh, standalone is uh, basically a local when i'm not going to use any hadoop yarn so i can use the standalone suppose my this text file data i want to read and i want to process i don't need to store this file in hadoop file system but suppose my data is in Hadoop file system and I want to process it, then I have to use the YARN cluster manager. So what is a Spark architecture? So a Spark architecture is when you are submitting a driver, one driver program you are writing, like you are seeing the main object, the Spark, you are like a Scala object class you are creating. So that is your main, main function and you want to start the execution from there. So you say it's a driver program and then when you are submitting your job when you are doing spark submit job on the cluster and you say spark submit minus minus class and my class is a class name so this class is nothing but your object you will be giving an object because we don't have any keyword is minus minus object the keyword is a minus minus class but we give the object name this should be your object my object where main function is there okay and then you define your jar name your my application dot jar some jar is there there your classes are there okay so when you do in the spark submit command on the dollar shell your driver program the program the class this object will start your execution and it will call the cluster manager so driver program i'm uh, saying this uh, object is a driver program the driver program is uh, like basically your entry point which is starting your execution which has the main function so this driver program is calling the cluster manager. The cluster manager will depend like uh, when the Spark submit also you are defining here minus minus master. So what master you are giving here? Suppose your master is a uh, local. So it will not use the Hadoop file system, but you will say master is a yarn or you are saying master is a yarn. So yarn master means, so you will, you will be reading the data from the Hadoop file system, okay? So in that case, your path should be Hadoop path. If you are giving a local path, it will say file not found. Okay, directly not found. So cluster manager will come in picture here and will call particular cluster manager and it will be distributing the data. Suppose you are uh, processing the data. So it will divide the data into multiple workers nodes, worker nodes, and worker nodes have executors. So what is executor here in the Spark? Executor is nothing but, which is executing your task, executing the task. So, so executor is a unit like, which is executing your task on the worker, okay? So one worker can have multiple executors, right? It, it is a core executor. So these things come in picture, course. Course is like a CPU processing um, unit, right? Uh, in course you have in the machine and executors you have, how many executors uh, you can have, like executor memory you have, core memory you have, driver memory you have, so this you have. So once your driver program is called cluster manager, cluster manager is giving like worker nodes, is assigning the task to the executors. And once executors is performing tasks, executor, executors are completing, 
completing task then the result will be the result will be return back to the cluster manager and cluster manager will be written back to the cluster manager will return back to driver back to driver so this is this is the flow right so how the driver program is called cluster manager worker nodes and then executors and executor performing tasks and it has one cache so cache okay spark is basically meant for it's an in memory computation we heard this word like in memory computation so spark is processing everything in the memory so that is the reason spark is 100 times faster in memory and 10 times faster in the disk because it is not storing your intermediate output data on the disk it is storing your data in your memory for the further processing but final result right when you want to store the result in the some storage right then you are writing the data to the disk right so that is the reason spark job is faster right because if we map reduce we say every time it is storing the output data intermediate output data it is storing the disk and again reading from the disk for further processing so batch it's a batch right so it is taking always data from the disk but spark is reading in the memory mm -hmm. does, it, does it mean it's a uh, the, <clears throat> the memory demand is high then yeah definitely because spark job if you have less memory then you cannot process the job right because if your data size is huge right suppose i'm going to process right. one tb data mm -hmm. and i'm trying to do with the like only only less 64 gb ram less less than. so it will not be efficiently do so yeah. that is the reason yeah spark is uh, having this capability but you have to configure your uh, configuration you have to make it higher okay so that kind of tuning we have to do whenever our job is getting slow so there are couple of reasons are there one is like my resources are very less right my resources are uh, not up to the mark right so that's the reason my job is not getting faster but sometimes my application code can give the trouble also like suppose my code is having a complex join and my query is getting slow so that is not the fault of your resources the, that is the fault of your application so you need to check whether your job execution is a uh, which end right executor side it's problem or driver side it's a problem okay so that kind of analysis we have to do sometime out of memory error you will get it so this mm -hmm. out of memory error generally we get in other different programming languages right what is the reason like my execution memory is less as compared to the memory we are giving to the our program so there is uh, if this kind of situation comes so spark has provided a persist function so persist having a five different persist label are there one is memory only okay disk only memory and disk only memory and disk actually it's uh, like some underscore is there memory and disk okay this is a constant okay in in persist function like this i have to pass uh, rdd persist and then i say some persistent label class is there persistent dot label persistent label and then i say dot this constant so i set this constant means it will do only by default is memory only you don't need to set it you don't need to set it but suppose your situation is your ram is less so one scenario is there suppose your ram is okay 64 gb okay and your data size is size of the data is very huge right 1000 gb okay so you cannot process entire data in a one go right 1000 gb data you cannot process in a one go data size okay so in this case what you will do you will use the persist level memory and disk so what it will do in this scenario it will take it your data as per the memory is available it will process it then for the data it will take it and process so like this it will do memory and disk so memory disk is uh, well efficient when you have sizes of your ram is less as compared to your data okay so then you can go for the persistent label disk and memory okay so when i'm reading the file so i have to give file colon triple slash okay and i say my path 
So data folder, I created a file, my test dot txt. So when you are using, when you are reading the file from a Hadoop, you don't need to give this file colon triple slash, okay? So you will see your RDD is like, like I'm getting a RDD because I, I told you I'm reading a text file, right? So definitely I will get the RDD, okay? When I'm doing RDD dot count, so I'm calling action now, then it will give me the result, right? Now it's giving the result is three. So how many number of rows are there in my text file three, right? Now I want to print the, this rows, right? I want to print these rows. So how can I do RDD sure. dot for each action? And I say X Lambda, I can use print ln X. Now you will be using the, your Spark Scala APIs. So here, this concept RDD, RDD is there, right? So RDD, you can create on a different, different ways how you can create RDD. One RDD you can create, like you can read the file and you can get the RDD. Another way is manual way you can create RDD. Like suppose you have a one list as a collection and this list uh, you want to make a RDD. So there is a parallelize function is there, sc.parallelize, okay? So sc.parallelize will create a RDD for you. Okay, just I'm taking an example. Like I have this, this sequence is there. And I'm just creating RDD by using the parallelize function. So I do the so two ways. Like one way is you can read a, any data source and get the RDD. Second way is you can create your own collection. You can create your own collection and then create RDD. So here you see first RDD you created by parallelize function. You pass the sequence or list any collection. Now it is a RDD type. This collection is uh, initially it's a collection. It's not related to Spark. Okay. But when I pass to the parallelize, now it has the quality of RDD. Okay. Because it has become now RDD because of this parallelize. Parallelize is like uh, it is distributed. So this array can be distributed in one machine, two machine, as number of machines it can do. Okay. But here is a one machine. But I'm talking about when it is in the distributed environment when a huge number of elements are there in your collection, it will be distributed into the multiple across the cluster, okay? So you don't know where it is distributed, right? But internally it is done. And when you are doing rdd.distinct, rdd2 dot now count. So I'm getting the five, okay? So what is in this rdd? So distinct when I do, so it will be giving me distinct element, right? It is giving me distinct element. Okay. When you are creating RDD here, so now this RDD is overridden or not? This RDD is overridden, right? So because in the same Scala shell, this Spark Scala shell session, if you write the same name again, right? So you will overwrite the existing RDD. So that's the reason we should be very careful. Like when we are defining a new RDD, so we should not use the existing RDD. So it will be overridden. Okay. So I have to do this operation again. This read operation I have to do again. This one. I have to read again. I'm reading a file. Okay, now I want to print RDD for each. Okay, I already showed that RDD.count. So action, I called it. Now I say, uh, I want to apply some map function on my RDD. RDD.map, I say, okay, first I apply the flat map because I have a list of lines are there. How many lines are there? Three lines are there. So what I need to do, these are the three lines. I want to make it in a single array, all the word. How can I do it? I can use the flat map. I can use RDD dot flat map. And then I say, I want to split it X, X dot split by space. 
So give the one space double code, otherwise it will split it by the character. Okay, just remember it. And then after you do collect function, collect will be giving you the collect will be giving you the result. Okay. So are you getting all the words in a single array? So you are getting splitting with the space. Okay. And it will be giving, so it is doing flattening. So what is the difference between the map and flat map? So map is basically taking one element and doing a one operation on that element. Okay. It is applying operation element by element, same operation element by element, and it is giving the same number of elements. But in case of flat map, you are doing flattening. You are combining all different arrays into one single array, like flattening of the data based on some criteria. Here is a criteria is space. So so these words are separated by the space. Okay. So you are combining all these words in a single array. Okay. So now, so far, you have done flattening of the data. Now, next operation I will do. This is the next transformation. So when I call collect, then only it calculated, right? So when I'm doing map and I say again, x, x of x dot, I will be making it the pair. I will say x comma one, okay? And then again, I do collect. Collect I'm doing for checking it, okay? So now you are getting what? Hello comma one. So this is same map reduce you are doing. Map reduce also you are doing the same job, right? Map reduce you are doing uh, each word you are giving a one count and, and then you are combining the same key and then you are getting the count, right? You are You are just doing the count on the same key. So here you can see in a single array, you are getting tuple. These are the tuple, right? Hello comma one, how comma one, r comma one. So these are the tuples are there. So this is map transformation. So map, what is doing map? It picked the first it element. Reduced by key. No, sorry. Reduce by key will come later after this, okay? Because then I want to uh, counting of the same key, okay? Then I will use a reduce by key. So here map is basically pick one element and it is giving a one count. This one element give one count, this element one count. So if you counted this number of element now or this number of element here, both are same. So map is always giving you the same number of element after your map operation. But in case of flat map, it is giving more number of element from your input RDD. Okay. Same, same we can do in the data frame also. Data frame also having the map, flat map, filter, join. Okay. So now I will be doing reduce by key. So reduce by key. I can use group by key. So what is the difference with the reduce by key? So what is the advantage over the reduce by key? Anybody knows reduce by key? It will be unique. Hmm? It, will, it, will, it, will, it will combine all the, all, all the... No, both are doing the same job. If you do group by key and reduce by key, both are doing aggregation of your count based on the key. If the same key is coming number of times, it will combine it. Okay. It, but group by key is, is having less uh, performance because uh, it is... It is transferring the data over the network, right? It's not uh, behaving like a combiner, but reduce by key is behaving like a map reduce combiner. It is doing the aggregation of the keys itself in the same node. Okay. So your less data travel over the network. Okay. When you are transferring data, so it will be less data as compared to group by key. So reduce by key having a less data. Okay. Right. So less data travel over the network, the performance will be improved, right? Because if I say, same key is 100,000 time is there, same key. Right. So which is better, 100,000 time you should send over the network or you should send only hello, oh, comma, 100,000. Which one is good? Hello, comma, 100,000 is good, right? Because only one you are sending rather than 100,000 times, right? Exactly. So reduce by key will do that, okay? So when you use reduce, but here in the less data, you will not find any difference, right? Because less data, you will not see the difference when the data is not number of times repeated data, right? So reduce by key, when you use reduce by key and you use underscore plus underscore. So here we are doing the aggregation, okay? Again, after that, I can do collect. 
So now you can see your word count is coming. R is three, how is three, hello is three, you are three, okay. But I want to do some, some uh, like I want to do, I want to find some filter things I want to do, but all are three, three, okay. Okay, suppose I add some more text in the file, okay. But I have to do all the operation again because when I save my file, I have to do again, I have to read the file. Okay. Then I will do flat map, then map, and then reduce by key. So now you see you got the difference, right? Hello, comma four is coming now, right? So you want to do filter. So filter is like you say, filter you want to do you want only the the count is coming more than three okay so you want to print only hello comma four so you will say x lambda you will use and then you say x dot see this is a pair rdd so here the two element are there you cannot say x or y right you cannot say x because here i have to do tuple and you know tuple how to access x dot underscore one or underscore two so when you know your tuple having two values, the so first value will be called underscore one and second value will be called underscore two. So which one you want to compare? Second one you want to compare, right? So you will say x dot underscore two greater than three, right? And then you close this and then dot correct. You are getting hello comma four. And this result you want to print you don't want to print like a, this is just showing array type, right? But I want to print uh, in a proper key value pair. So for each, now you call this action and say again, Lambda X. And this X is basically representing both. Again, it is a key value, right? So you say print ln X dot underscore one, okay? comma x dot underscore two. So now it's coming hello comma four. So both are coming, both are printing. A separate, separate also you can print. So two print ln you can do and then you can print. Okay. Okay, so this is a simple word count when you are reading a text file, when you are reading a RDD. Okay, so when you are doing RDD and then there are so many operations are there, join operation, you can do uh, union, intersection, anything you can do because RDD supports uh, all transformation. Okay. Why you are passing parameter in reduce by key? Like passing the parameter to what? In reduce by key, we are underscore plus underscore what purposes. Okay. So, Very how well. can I? Okay. This is a pair RDD. Okay. And this is a tuple. So tuple element always accessible with the uh, like a index parameter you have to give. So underscore one underscore two is a way for accessing any tuple parameter. Okay. So X is suppose I'm saying X is my first value of tuple and uh, first object. Okay. And that I want to first pair. Okay. But here is only one pair, but maybe a multiple pairs can be there. Okay. So this X is running for that. Okay. For multiple pair. Okay, so for each X and in each X, there are the two values in the tuple, one and two. So if I give one or two, then only I can access one and two value. Okay, if I try zero, what happens? Because zero is not an index. The error is coming. Arvin, <laughs> what is the difference between pair RDD, normal RDD? When we'll go see pair the... RDD like uh, when you have x comma y form comma separate form or RDD is like a simple like collection you have list okay just you created a list element and then you have single element RDDs okay this one this one okay but you can make it pair with this right you can use some transformation right you say x comma x comma x multiply two okay from this RDD two I can make it pair RDD how can I make it so you say rdd2 dot map and say element are x right now only one element is there right so you say x 
okay you just say any name b and then you say g comma g multiplied to so here now one more extra element will come or not right this this will become pair right here and now i do collect i use capital can you see the single element rdd i converted into the pair rdd so generally when we have a requirement i want to make it key value pair okay i can make it so but this is a symmetry here in the values can you see symmetry if whatever element is there you have a multiply of two that's the value right so you can do um because everything we deals in the right map reduce spark like key value pair so key value pair like key is associated with value so we can easily do the our transformations and we can do but that type of requirement is there suppose i say my key is hello and i want to store as a value is a count so what i will do in the value here length i will use the length suppose this is a string type of rd okay suppose i say here i want to make it pair i want to take it key as it is okay but i want to make it length of so x dot underscore one dot length so what it will do so key will come as the first element and eth Okay. The end for length. Or... No, no. X dot underscore one. No. Oh, print ln. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Print ln. We cannot do this. We have to do in the map itself because I have to create in the map. No, that length will be one, right? Uh, you mentioned. Ah, length will be one, but I want to get dynamic way, right? Map X. X, I say X dot underscore one is my key, okay, and then I say X dot underscore two. I want to get okay. Length we cannot use like this. X dot underscore length. We have to use, I think, length bracket with it, it will give the length. It is found uh, column required as a column type. Is some string column. So finishing the type to int. Changing the type to int. Two string to length. Yeah. But this is oh, this is an integer value. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, it Found is. Int. Int. So we do the length on. Uh, 
on this string. Thing. Here we can do, okay, x underscore one we do. Because this is string, right? First value. But, uh, okay, how will the line is used? Map. Okay, we have to do dot only, like whatever value is there. I think that's one x dot one dot now it's coming. Yeah. Actually that dot is there. So dot length, then it is giving the RDD, pair RDD with the key comma length. Okay. So I'm getting the length. So suppose I want to find the length of each uh, element in the RDD and then I want to compare it, see whose length is more. Okay, so I want to find the, the element which has the maximum length. So this kind of use cases could be there or you want to reverse a string, right? Okay, so you can each uh, RDD element you want to reverse, okay? Okay, so data frame, like suppose you are reading a, some CSV file. I have a, some CSV file and I want to read the CSV file. So I'm creating a, some CSV file. ID. So this CSV file, I save it. Okay, so now one way is you read it as a RDD. Okay, as a text file, you read and then you define the schema. You give the schema to the, then we have to create a struct type schema. Another easy way is there directly you can read the data frame because this one is a CSV file because, okay, well df equal to spark dot read dot CSV. If you have JSON file, you can read JSON, XML, XML, Parquet, Parquet, ORC, read.org. The direct function is there. Now you will give it file colon triple slash data slash my data dot CSV. Now df dot count. So two rows are there. Okay. So you are getting here df dot show you do, you will get the data frame result, right? But here is column header is not coming. So you have to add uh, option. So read dot csv option and then header equal to true. So, but header is not there in the file, right? Even you do option header equal to true, it will not come. So you can do two df you can do and then you can you can set the columns okay so df dot or you can do two df how to set the column actually while reading the file that time you can set it this one 2df. Okay, so it will convert before converting data frame, it will set the column. So we know three columns are there ID, okay, name, age. Now, if I print my df dot show, so by default, it gives a 20 because my data frame has only two rows. But if you have more than 20, you will get only 20, initial 20, you will get. Okay, so what are the data frame operation you can do? Data frame dot uh, show you date. Like I want to create a width column. So because we know this is a table, right? Row and column. And I want to do data frame dot width column. I want to add a new column. I say age one. And I want to 
plus the value. So I say So now I say, or uh, you don't need to store it. You can directly do show here. So it will not store. So it is just doing the plus one. Okay, so you are doing, suppose you want to add a, some string literal column. So you can use lit and you can pass like this, it will be adding the values okay so you can do the manipulation row level man manipulation you can do and column level manipulation you can do column level manipulation like you can do um, like with column filter anything you can do okay if i say df dot filter and i want to say i want to get the only row for age is greater than 30 how to write this age is greater than 30 okay and then dot show so it is very easy, right? Like we can write the operations, right? Filter, I want to have two data frames and I want to do the join. I can do the join. So data frame one and data frame two join I can do. Okay, same same file, I load it one more time. Okay, I say this data frame is a DF1. Okay, DF1. Okay, now I want to join the two data frames. So I say next new data frame. Having having a half equation. Can we do SQL join here? Yeah. 
audio is lost. Can anybody hear me? Hello? Yes, we're able to hear you. Yeah, we're able to hear you. Okay. Can I, I can't hear him again. Is he audible? No, he's not audible. Okay, thank you. 